<laughs> Thank you for being here. It is a joy to be part of this day, to be in my very favorite state in the whole world, to be reading with these wonderful poets, Judith and Patrick, and to be part of this program, Poetry at Tech, which Tom Lux, uh, as has been pointed out, has turned into such a rich uh, and wonderful experience for all of us. And with the help of Ginger Murchison, his magical assistant, um, has made magical for all of us. I'm going to start with some poems um, about Georgia, or drawn from Georgia, since that's what I am. And um, I'll mention first, maybe you've had the experience already, some of you as students, of having teachers that you remember vividly. And some teachers you can barely remember at all. Um, it turns out, I have found out, that one of the teachers I remember most vividly is someone that many of my friends simply don't remember. Uh, this is because she was a very quiet, low-key sort of person. Um, not a beauty, not uh, glamorous or dramatic in any way. She was uh, a teacher of dance and very, very good at what she did. She taught at uh, Jacob's Pillow each summer in the very um, forefront of modern dance, but she taught other kinds as well. And one time I had a private lesson with her, and she danced for me briefly, and I saw a completely different person, a transformation. Private lessons. Miss Dalton told me once that her castanets were carved for her by Rita Hayworth's father. The left castanets, the man, the right's the woman, who speaks four times, four fingers rolled off the edge, before the man speaks once. Senor Cancino had taught her everything. She would tuck the castanets in her bra to warm them, so that when she played, their voices would be deep. While someone stuttered Albanith on a piano near the studio mirror, she passed on her art to me, the three-type lightning of toe heel heel, the brush of castanets above the head, how to turn your chin as if to watch one clicking hand rise from the small of your back, arc outward and up to meet the other, how to pull your wrist diagonally, hip, to throat as slowly as a torero's blade holding every man's eyes. The dance slept inside Miss Dalton like a secret. When it rose, her long spinster body began to arch as if Signor Cancino were watching. Her warm castanets fluttered, pulsed like hands inside her hands. She was speaking speaking, his deep voice again and again an answer. I grew up in College Park, Georgia, um, a small suburban um, city, town. Uh, of course, it was the whole world to those of us who grew up there, but it was rather small at the time. Uh, it was a planned city. and. Um, and, and, and people behaved themselves back then, or we didn't know about it if they didn't. Uh, but things have happened to, to College Park. And one of the things that has happened to College Park is the Atlanta airport. Uh, it started early and grew and grew and grew until like a cancer, it managed to cut down the spine of College Park managed to cut down um, right by the railroad tracks, down Main Street, and take so many of the houses uh, where people had lived and loved living. One uh, man told me that it broke his mother's heart, literally, to lose her home, and she died. Um, and then they, they concreted it over, and they covered it with asphalt for roads, for tarmac, 
and it was as though it had never been there. But of course it was there. Holding patterns. Staring at concrete, you can only imagine the streets that disappeared under Hartsfield Airport, East Oxford, Yale, the piano teacher's house where porcelain ladies swirled on mahogany tables and hyacinths bloomed in china bowls in early spring, where after recitals there were cherries and whipped cream. At the high school reunion, no one returned who had lived in the part of town airplanes have made desert. <clears throat> this is not Brigadoon. There will always be nowhere to come back to. From where houses stood, planes take off, one a minute, dropping exhaust as they rise over Camp Creek. Sometimes returning, they wait in holding patterns, flying along imagined avenues in the air. Then, if someone looks down, he may see where a road pulls out from the runway, begins again might see the cemetery we thought would wait for us, our family's names in marble crumbling under the fumes. Yes, there are TVA lakes with whole towns under them, a road going down, coming out, where a swimmer, when the light is right, could see it all. But there are other burials. <clears throat> My name, Mimi, uh, is spelled M-E-M-Y-E, -E, which was my grandmother's idea, um, because it's a contraction of uh, the name that all the women in my maternal line have had for generations, Mary Emmy. And since there was already a Mary uh, in our house and an Emmy in our house, my grandmother, um, mine was contracted to M-E-M-Y-E. -E. I heard about these grandmothers uh, through stories, and the stories were always of legendarily brave, um, intelligent, curious, compassionate, creative women. And now I'm, I'm the last one left with this name, and, um, and that's a lot to bear. Ghosts. The ghosts of my grandmothers will not be trifled with or teased into speech. They have already spoken. Now they watch. Wax in the proper places, smiles, sacrifice, no salt on silver, children warned of the undertow, a glass of milk for the stranger at the door, as little lying as possible, as little truth. They want such things remembered, and no jot or tittle more, no sniveling early to bed, waste not. They are awake all night. They wasted nothing and still want everything. I try to satisfy them, but I spill the milk, grow tired, tell strangers what I suspect of the truth. Yet I speak with their voices, lie under their quilts, bear their hand-me-down names. No man owns us, but we own each other. Our lives are one long life. Milk, child, myth, on good days, bequeathed like family silver. I polish the spoons, holding them up to the dark. Did you ever... Um, take a trip, maybe stopping at various airports along the way, <clears throat> and think to yourself, I know somebody who lives here. I could just call them up and say hello. And then you don't. Uh, this, this poem um, is about such a thing. Airport phone booth. All those men who couldn't live without me did. <laughs> I see their faces as I travel through their cities. If I telephoned, intelligent children would answer, 
cool wives would wait at perfect dining tables, and deep, polite voices would be fine. How am I? One of my very favorite joys in life um, is rocks. I, I, I just love rocks because you don't have to feed them. Uh, you, you don't have to water them. You don't have to take them out. Um, but they just stay there being beautiful. And um, ever since I was about nine years old, uh, I've, just, I've been just sort of crazy about rocks, as uh, my friends know. Um, I've been writing, uh, well, I write poems about rocks, but this is from a series of poems about minerals uh, based on Moe's scale of hardness. Four is its hardness. Fluorite. Almost closing time at the, maybe I should tell you, have you ever been to this wonderful jail up in Asheville, North Carolina that they've turned into a museum, a rock museum? Let me recommend that you go there. What could be more joy? I guess maybe Christmas shopping with a lot of money might be, but I don't think so. Uh, this, is, this is just wonderful. Almost closing time at the jail become museum. Only one cell left, the ink black room they pushed us into, the other tourist and me. A man as silent as I. We waited while the Rock Society volunteer found the switch. Then suddenly, in black light, each rock began to burn. Purple, pink, yellow. Believe this. We saw with our own eyes rocks transformed into stars. And then we stumbled out into the street, pretending to be who we were before. In that small blue dark, if we'd even shared a smile, our teeth would have glowed. Another thing I really um, have enjoyed is, is having time as a resident fellow at Artist Colonies. Uh, to me, it is just a joy to talk with composers, with painters, um, with novelists, uh, and dramatists and filmmakers, and all these folks about what they are doing, and um, to some degree, about their lives. Uh, the point I had on this subject, I just remembered I forgot to bring. Nevertheless, um, I will read another poem on a similar subject, which is what you do after breakfast at the artist colony. You go into the woods to your studio. And uh, one day at McDowell, I went to my studio, and there was an orange salamander on the rock that was the doorstep. The orange salamander is gone, who was a bright plastic prize yesterday on the doorstep, whose insides trailed him paler orange, who was stuck to the granite slab, his webbed feet moving. His tail straightened itself as I watched, unable to save him or crush him. I closed the door. I pictured the rock empty and an orange tail disappearing down the sandy road, but he stayed. He is brown orange now, the shape of salamanders in textbooks who are not alive or dead, and we turn the page without guilt. Around him, ferns never noticed. A color dies, no benediction. Pink fades to gray, then its ashes under a stone. I have lost again my forgetfulness of loss. Wherever I step, I may kill something, a beneficent spider, a violet. I felt nothing underfoot. Was it I who stepped on the salamander? I tell myself lies. Who'd believe my denials? When I speak to you of this, it's a little push toward the grave. Take care. 
Haven't I already killed without thought? Ask the salamander. Some, some things that have happened uh, recently uh, reminded me of this poem that I came across in my papers um, as I was uh, thinking about poems to read today. Uh, it's, it's dated October 21st, 2001. And uh, someday people will forget even more than we have now, uh, probably, exactly what was going on on that day, which was after 9-11. But sadly, the same story goes on all through human history. Uh, the story of refugees, the story of non-combatants uh, losing their homes and dying, falling, October 21st, 2001. Beyond the Khyber Pass, yellow flakes descend, packets of barley stew, peanut butter, shortbread, American wheat for starving rice eaters, 2,200 2, indigestible calories. Over the minefields, refugees run up to sw run to sweep up manna lettered in an unknown tongue. In Manhattan, falls disappearing, parks filled with last chance parents pushing strollers. In their saddlebags are bottles of water, handfuls of cash in case another skyscraper falls, all its expensive concrete and steel and burned papers and bodies rushing to be breath. Tomorrow, the clock will say there's an extra hour to save the world. September's gone. Smoke still rises. God smells the burned bodies and the handful of shortbread cookies offered like birthday treats come early. Yellow candles falling from airplanes onto a frozen world. Um, there's so many approaches to poetry, as you as you know, um, to the to the thing in itself, to the text in itself, to the biography of the writer, uh, to whatever, or to the reader's response. Um, James McNeil Whistler was one of the art for art's sakes uh, painters, as you may remember. Um, who believed that you shouldn't read narrative into every painting. And this is what he said, the vast majority of English folk cannot and will not consider a picture as a picture, apart from any story which it may be supposed to tell. I, however, uh, am a human being too. And like uh, the vast majority of English folk, um, sometimes see a picture as, as more. Arrangement in gray and black, number one, portrait of the artist's mother. She's folded her hand, he's folded her hands in the lap of her black dress. She's the star of his still life, its isosceles of fruit, its golden third. Her name is the artist's mother. Her solemn face is his, There's thus handsome, the lace quaffs a crown. She's immortal now, he thinks. And she, 22 years, a widow, now I'm art for art's sake, a profile in drying paint. When joints weaken and buttons and knives slip away, what can my hands do but comfort each other? He paints me turned away, unable to touch him. Loss brings gifts. Flowers wakened by fire, new countries to run to, silence after pain, and for each futile wandering hand, a home to return to, gentle fingers no one else would crave. Um, I'd like to read uh, two more poems, and I'm going to read them very fast so that I won't take a lot of time. Uh, of course, I've never read this out loud before, so I may stumble. Um, 
when we think uh, about history, it's all so, so, so full and rich of things and people, uh, as, in, as in Judas' poems, of pure and wonderful water of childhood and not so wonderful sometimes, uh, as in Patrick's poems. Uh, just take any year. And so, and I took the year 1910 because it intrigued me that in 1910 things seemed to change and, and have different kinds of facets. It, the things had to do with relativity and perspective, uh, as in uh, the Pirandello Six, who you may know. 1910. Because the outside of the globe, oh, let me tell you one thing. I, the, this poem is written with two lines, and then the third line is a quotation from some famous poem or song, generally. Because the outside of the globe has four dimensions, and the inside four dimensions, at the round earth's imagined corners blow, a mercator map we imagine front, then back, before we lift a damp finger to the wind, ich kann nicht anders. Because we are less than a broken comma in the orbiting machine we use for eyes, and worms rejoice in the temple of our bodies. Because that day the stranger blurted, this is the day I learned they had given my birthday to my sister. This is how I came, I put here my knee, there my foot. My father is disguised as a boy living in Austria, don't tell, and never came back, though hers, we could make believe, was the one interesting thought in that day full of pencils straining for metaphor, ex nihilo, faces packed for shipping, lest they break into facets. Think of Freud, 1910. The year of E equals MC square. The year Picasso walked through Brock and glimpsed the six-sided cubes of time before my parents were born. Oh, brave new world. Oh, unreliable narrator. Oh, Jamesian attic window. Twelve years before Pirandello rattled in the new science. A messenger with letters new come from Padua. It began. But in College Park, my grandparents did not know the world had changed, so it didn't. Stains the white radiance of eternity, though my great-grandmother's sister had already written to her, what do you think of the new ragtime? Edith loves it. Oh, do de oh, do 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 de oh, do My grandmother still cooked spoon bread and painted copies of Titian, not the bare parts and labeled toward an unchanging century, not knowing the towers would whirl into atoms not to be reassembled, had come in disguise as napalm, why this is hell, nor am I out of it. That language would fall of its own weight and turn into dream. Picasso and Einstein would take new wives, barely distinguishable from their first. Though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. And for my last poem, back to College Park, and this time back to my grandfather. Dusk in College Park. Sit with me on the cold front steps to wait for the air raid warden who comes in the dark to protect us. I tell you with some pride, he is my grandfather, who died 30 years ago, a man of unalloyed constancy. This afternoon, something nuclear fell into the Indian Ocean. Nothing fell on Rugby Avenue in the soft dusk at the one door in the world that never changes, where my grandfather, flashlight muffled, invisible to the enemy, walks his watch by moonlight. Thank you.